I beat every Elder Dragon in Monster Hunter. Over the past three months, I have been killing or hunting every Elder Dragon within the Monster Hunter series. It is one of the toughest things I have done in my years of playing Monster Hunter. Through doing this challenge, I ended up with encountering some of the most difficult monsters in the entire series, and it really pushed my limits as a Monster Hunter player. This took place over almost 20 Monster Hunter games, which covers the majority of the series as I covered all 17 mainline series entries and the majority of the spin-off games. In order to tackle such a large review of all these monsters, I will break up each video into one generation of the games, meaning that the first video will be on Generation 1, then Generation 2, Generation 3, Generation 4, Generation 5, Frontier, and then other spin-offs. However, before we can get into the reviewing of all these monsters, I need to define what an Elder Dragon is. An Elder Dragon is a specific class of monster found within the Monster Hunter series. These types of monsters don't fit into any other classifications of Wyvern found in the world of Monster Hunter, so a new category was made specifically for them. They are beings with immense power. Some people within the world of Monster Hunter likening them to cataclysms or forces of nature. Within that classification of an Elder Dragon, there is a further subsection, Black Dragons or Dangerous First Class Monsters, which are monsters that the guild, the governing body of the Monster Hunter world, have identified as being dangerous and defying comprehension. There are nine Elder Dragons classified as Black Dragons or Dangerous First Class Monsters. They will be identified and explained as the videos go on. There are a grand total of 51 Elder Dragons in the mainline Monster Hunter series currently. This number includes every game from Monster Hunter 1 all the way through to Monster Hunter Rise Sunbreak. Alongside the mainline series, there are an additional 31 Elder Dragons in other Monster Hunter games that are not a part of the mainline series. So this is every Elder Dragon from Stories 1, Stories 2, Monster Hunter Frontier and Monster Hunter Explore, as well as a couple other sources. Through these videos, I hope to provide an insight into the many interesting and exclusive Elder Dragon fights that the Monster Hunter series has on offer, and give a rough guide on how I went about fighting each monster. So, without further ado, here is how I beat every Elder Dragon in Monster Hunter. There were only five Elder Dragons in Generation 1 as the series was still in its infancy during this period of time. Despite there only being a few Elder Dragons, Generation 1 has arguably one of the most iconic Elder Dragons in it. In Generation 1 there are three games, Monster Hunter 1, Monster Hunter G, and Monster Hunter Freedom. These three games form the base from which the rest of the series has spawned from. It is interesting to look at where the series began and what effect that has had on the series as a whole. There are three Elder Dragons in the original Monster Hunter 1, Lao Shen Lung, Kirin, and Fatalis. Two of them are siege fights, and the other one is a regular hunt. Lao Shenlong is a massive Elder Dragon, introduced in the first Monster Hunter game. It is one of the largest monsters in the entire series, which is quite interesting, considering that the first game, with all its hardware limitations, was able to house a monster like Lao. Lao Shenlong stands at a whopping 6,960cm, that is nearly 70 meters long. Despite its massive size, it is quite a passive monster, and rarely attacks the player directly. However, it can indirectly damage the hunter with its massive legs and tail with a hitbox size to rival Plesiot's hip check. 
Lau is more focused on destroying the town fortress, which is the area you fight it in. Lau has a red appearance with its many spikes covering its body. It possesses the dragon element despite not using it in the fight, instead resorting to using its massive physical size to attack and crush entire villages. The in-game description for Lau in Monster Hunter 1 is a giant dragon few have seen and lived to tell the tale. When on the rampage, it wrecks havoc on all in its path. The guild has built a fortress to repel the beast, but will it hold? Now we're going to shift our focus onto the fight itself. Personally, I find the fight long and drawn out to put it plainly. If you enjoy attacking pixels on a screen and advancing at the rate of a snail on a treadmill, this fight is for you. The fortress is where the fight takes place, a unique area in Monster Hunter. There are six areas in the fortress and only in four of those can you attack Lau. At the beginning of the fight, a cutscene will play in area one that shows Lau slowly lumbering towards the fortress. After this cutscene takes place, you need to leave area one to go to the camp where you can grab supplies for the fight like whetstones, bombs, ballistae and first aid mitts. The first part of the attack on Lau takes place in Area 2, where you can start wailing on Lau. The best way to do this is either by attacking the head or underbelly of Lau, as they tend to be the safest places to hit him, and to make sure you don't take damage from Lau's feet or tail. There is a bridge in Area 2 that you can climb up onto that allows you to jump onto Lau's back. From here, Lau will also do one of its only attacks that targets the player. Lau will roar and stand on its hind legs in order to use its head to swipe at players on the bridge. It does this move twice before going back onto all fours, from which the player can jump onto its back. From here, the player can carve materials off its back up to a total of three carves. However, you cannot attack Lau while you're on its back. After the player stays on Lau's back for long enough, it will cause a roar, causing the player to be thrown onto the ground. This pretty much sums up area 2 of the fight. Area 3 is a more straightforward area. Simply attack either the head, belly, or Lau in this area. At the end of area 3, Lau will reach a barricade, which it will physically attack and destroy by body slamming into it. Area 4 is similar to area 2, as it also has a bridge that players can use to get onto Lau's back. And apart from that, there's no real special qualities to the fight. Area 6 is the next area the player will encounter, which is a special area as Lau cannot be fought in this area. It is a pathway to Area 5. In Area 6, Ayupre will spawn in order to interrupt the hunt and poison the hunter. Area 5 is interesting, as it is the final phase of the fight. Within this area, there are several battlements, including a Dragonator, two Ballistae, and two Cannons. These can all be used effectively against Lau in this area, especially the Dragonator. Lau can only be killed in this area in the mainland games, so you can fail the quest if you flinch him enough in any of the other areas as you will time out. The best way to approach Area 5 is by gathering Ballistae in the camp or item box and using the Ballistae to hit Lau as it approaches the fortress. When Lau gets really close, use the Dragonator to deal a lot of damage to Lau. From here, you want to attack the belly of Lau, as it is easy to hit and the hunter usually won't be hit in this area. If you are successful, you will kill or repel Lau. There are several endings to the fight. Either Lau will be repelled or killed, or the fortress will be destroyed, or time will run out. So all in all, not the most exciting fight, but interesting to fight him just once or twice. So the next monster is Kirin. After that last snoozer, we're onto a monster that slightly more people have fought. Kirin is an elder dragon introduced in Monster Hunter 1. It looks very similar to a unicorn or horse and has pale blue skin. 
It's the smallest Elder Dragon in the series, ranging from sizes of 371.4cm and 989.64cm. It has crimson eyes that stand out in comparison to its blue and white body. It uses the thunder element in its attacks, as well as the paralysis ailment. Kieran summons thunder strikes around it in order to attack players, and will practically run circles around the hunter. Kieran's in-game description reads, Kieran is said to glow a faint blue, but so few have seen it that details are scarce. It is apparently capable of calling forth lightning at will. Kieran material is very valuable, and there are two locales within Mont Hunter 1 that the hunter can fight Kieran in. They are the Old Swamp and the Old Jungle. Kieran's fight in Mont Hunter 1 is a pretty regular fight. It can use paralysis and thunder attacks, so it does make him getting close to Kieran a pain. It can do several attacks, including, but not limited to, calling down lightning around itself, calling down lightning near the hunter, a charge forward, and a hop from side to side. Personally, I found that in Gem 1 especially, Kieran's speed is difficult to deal with because it can just outmaneuver the player, as Gem 1 has some pretty shitty controls. Kieran's horn can be broken during the fight, which makes it easier to deal with the thunder and especially the paralysis. The only monster that provides good thunder resistance for the Kieran fight is Kezu, so use that when fighting Gem 1 Kieran. Your web can only hit certain places on Kieran's body without bouncing off. Greatsword especially feels the impact of this, due to the lack of being able to charge the weapon, so this makes the fight really challenging. Apart from this, the best strategy for Kieran would be playing a weapon that either has rain, mobility, or good defense capabilities. So it hurts to say that any weapon except for Greatsword is pretty much suitable for the fight. Overall, Gen 1 Kirin is the least flashy and most normal Elder out of the three. It isn't a giant walking mountain and it isn't able to destroy entire kingdoms. This honestly makes me like Monster Hunter 1 Kirin more. It's simple and executed well, unlike a <clears throat> certain Elder Dragon that uh, we may have previously talked about. <clears throat> Fatalis is the big boy of Monster Hunter 1. It's the final boss of Monster Hunter 1's online hub. Fatalis is the first black dragon to be introduced into the Monster Hunter series, and therefore is one of the most iconic and most powerful monsters in the series. It stands at a respectable 4,110.6 centimeters, all the way through from its first gen size to its fourth gen size. Its size was changed from fifth gen. So it's a pretty large elder dragon. Fatalis resembles a traditional dragon in its appearance and has wings, horns, spikes running along its back and a really, really long tail with a long ass hit zone. Alongside this, Fatalis uses two elements, dragon and fire. Fatalis is an incredibly intelligent monster. It possesses a hatred for all of humanity and this was reflected in the fact that it has the power to raise entire kingdoms. The player hunts Fatalis in Castle Shred the only known location of Fatalis. It's a place surrounded by mystery. Fatalis' description is as follows. A legendary black dragon said to have prowled these lands from the days of old. Many skilled hunters have sought to challenge it, but none ever return. A monster shrouded in mystery. There are four different Fatalis quests in Monster Hunter 1. Quest 1 has the least options available for the hunter and Quest 4 has the most. However, Quest 1 costs less zenny than Quest 4. All four quests go for 15 minutes each, and the goal of each quest is to either repel or kill Fatalis. In order to unlock Fatalis in Monster Hunter 1, every online quest from 1 star to 6 star needed to be completed, and at least 100 wyverns needed to be killed. The Fatalis fight in Monster Hunter 1 enables the hunter to use a variety of different parts of Castle Trade, such as the Ballistae, Cannons, and Dragonators as well as a unique mechanic to Gen 1 and Gen 2 Fatalis, the gate. The gate automatically activates and falls on Fatalis when it passes underneath it. At the start of the fight, a cutscene will play, 
This cutscene can't be skipped. So if you fight Fatalis five times to get a kill, you need to watch this cutscene each time, and it's about a minute long. Gen 1 Fatalis is nothing to mess with. A lot of his attacks can cause a high amount of damage, most of the time ending in the player's carding. Even something as simple as Fatalis walking can cause an instant cut. It is a difficult fight, mostly because of the one-shot potential, which makes the fight really tedious, as you need to play safely for a long period of time. Personally, I'd say that the best weapon to use against Gem 1 Fatalis is 100% without a doubt the bow guns and jewel blades. This is because they are able to do damage either from range or quickly, which is invaluable to have as Fatalis has the high health threshold and getting close to it is dangerous. Fatalis' head can be broken twice, its chest once and each wing once. Monster Hunter 1 Fatalis was also considered extremely difficult to solo. It will do a range of attacks, such as launching fireballs, charges, swipes with its tail and hand, and it can go from standing on its hind legs to going on all fours. There are a total of 9 calves possible for Fatalis. 3 on the head, 3 on the upper body, and 3 on the lower body. Fatalis is by far the most challenging Elder Dragon out of the 3 available in Monster Hunter 1. I'd recommend you tackle him with at least two other people. Overall, Monster Hunter 1 Fatalis is a pretty interesting fight. It's a bit rudimentary at times, especially with the god awful hitboxes, but it is interesting to see how the mechanics of Castle Trade work alongside the Dragonator, which is really satisfying when you land it. This concludes all the Elder Dragons in Monster Hunter 1, that being Lao Shen Lung, Kirin, and Fatalis. Moving on to the next game in the series, Monster Hunter G, released in 2005 for the PS2. It introduced another two Elder Dragons, However, they were both subspecies, so they aren't the most exciting in the world. Monster Hunter G did expand and improve the original Monster Hunter experience without changing too much. There isn't much else to say about Monster Hunter G. It served mainly as an expansion of Monster Hunter 1. So the first monster for Monster Hunter G that we're going to talk about is Ashen Laotian Lung. It's a subspecies of the regular Laotian Lung. The fight in Monster Hunter G is very similar to the regular fight that was in Monster Hunter 1 of Laotian Lung. There are a couple differences though, such as the intro cutscene being slightly different and the fact that the skin is slightly tougher to break through. It's the same length at 6960 centimeters. And Ashen Lao is actually just a regular Laotian lung that's been exposed to a lot of volcanic debris that's caused its carapace to discolor to ash. Ashen Lao also shares the same in-game description as regular Laotian lung. The fight itself has no real differences. Ashen Lao is fought in the same fortress that regular Lao is. It goes through each area in the same order and the player can climb on its back in the same areas. Overall, Ashen Lao Shen Lung is the exact same as regular Lao. You just fight it later on in the game, and it has more HP. This was back when a subspecies of a monster was pretty much just a color change. And that just about wraps up Ashen Lao Shen Lung. There's nothing else really to be said about him. Alright, so moving on to Crimson Fatalis. The Crimson Fatalis fight is a very different ballpark from the regular Fatalis fight in Monster Hunter G. It's fought in a very different location to the regular Fatalis, the battleground. This is where the player will need cool drinks. It's quite similar to Area 7 of the old volcano. Crimson Fatalis physically is changed from a regular Fatalis. 
This is because of its many generations of exposure around the volcano. It was introduced in Monster Hunter G and is the final boss of the online hub. Crimson Fatalis is extremely aggressive and uses both fire and dragon elements, quite similar to the regular Fatalis. It is quite a large elder dragon at 4110.6 centimeters and one of its horns is extremely overgrown due to Crimson Fatalis' origin. Simply put, Crimson Fatalis is a regular Fatalis that has just been constantly in a state of rage. This meant that it slowly turned red over time, and yes, like regular Fatalis, it possesses an undying hatred for humanity. The fight. Crimson Fatalis has an insta-kill move at the start of the hunt, its dive bomb attack. It does this right after the cutscene. If the hunter does not react immediately after the cutscene, they basically get instantly cutted or take a lot of damage. During the fight, Crimson Fatalis has a number of different abilities ranging from flying high into the air and doing a dive bomb attack towards the hunters, like I previously mentioned. It also summons meteors whenever it draws that shower all around it. As the fight does not take place at Castle Shrade, there are no battlements, so there aren't any Ballistae, Cannons, and no Dragonator. The only issue with the Gem 1 Crimson Fatalis fight is you're pretty much limited to 30 minutes, because you can only carry 3 cold drinks with you per hunt. Unless you have the heat resist skill, or you have the master craft more cold drinks. The best way to go about dealing damage and fighting Crimson Fatalis is to use a ranged weapon, dual blades, or lance. During the fight, when enraged, Crimson Fatalis will activate its armor mode, which is when its body will start to glow orange. During this phase, you should try to bomb it, as all melee weapons will bounce unless they have Mind's Eye. Another thing to note is that all hit zones on the body will be reduced to 10. An armor mode occurs more and more as Crimson Vitalis gets lower and lower with health. The head can once again be broken twice, the chest once and each wing once. Crimson Vitalis can be carved a total of 9 times, 3 on the head, 3 on the upper body and then 3 in the lower body. Crimson Vitalis can die outside the map causing you to lose all carves and he can land and fly to places that he cannot be hit with a melee weapon, so this does make him difficult to fight. The fight is different enough to regular Fatalis, where it remains a challenge and is probably the most difficult monster to fight in Gen 1, in my opinion. So for returning elders to Monster Hunter G from Monster Hunter 1, all three of the elders introduced in Monster Hunter 1 returned in Monster Hunter G, because Monster Hunter G was more of an expansion to Monster Hunter 1. None of their movesets have really changed, so there's no real need to review them. So for the next game in the series, Monster Hunter Freedom, all the elders from Monster Hunter 1 and Monster Hunter G returned in Monster Hunter Freedom, so all five returned. This means once again there's no real need to alter my opinion, as Monster Hunter Freedom was merely an expansion of Monster Hunter 1 and Monster Hunter G, as well as a western port for Monster Hunter G. Alright, so the overview of Generation 1. Generation 1 introduces some of the most interesting elders in the series, and some that have the most lore and speculation surrounding them. I do find it interesting that there are only 5 elders in the first generation of games, but they all seem to count. There aren't really any throwaway elders. It's a classification of monster that is seen to be extremely powerful, and a force to be reckoned with. Both Laosh and Lung and its subspecies are massive in comparison to the Hunter, and Fatalis needs no explanation. The lack of options the player has available to them with regards to weapon move set, item availability and general movement also accentuate the difficulty of these fights. Overall, first gen Monster Hunter is unique in its simplicity and it provided a solid foundation for the series to grow from.